you wish upon a star. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. Disneyland. Just go to Action Park, there's no other park like it. Six Flags Great Adventure. It's not a world away. Paramount's Kings Island. We will officially open Universal Studios Florida. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. Now, here is your host. Hi, and welcome back to the Defunct Land Podcast. My name is Kevin Perger. Today, we are doing another post-episode discussion, this time on the most recent episode of Defunct Land, which was Club Disney and, you know, partly ESPN Zone. We talk a lot about Disney Regional Entertainment, especially their um, Discovery Zone, Chuck E. Cheese um, concept, Club Disney, which opened five locations across the United States. Um, I recommend watching that episode before, but if you've already seen the episode, this is going to take a much deeper dive. And I'm so happy to have um, here with me, Sean, who worked at Club Disney and ESPN Zone. So, Sean, uh, thank you for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. So can you just kind of explain to me uh, your role with Disney at this time and when it started, when it ended, just in general terms, so we know the timeline and uh, what locations you worked at? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I started with Disney at uh, the Disney stores and, uh, and the one in Thousand Oaks. And we had heard that there was this concept that was opening up that we really didn't know, know a lot about. But we just heard this concept of Disney was opening uh, interactive kids play site. So uh, myself and a handful of uh, people from the Disney store uh, interviewed, uh, you know, for the position while they're still it was still being built. And we were one of the first to be brought on as uh, the opening cast. Uh, so uh at that time i was brought on as one of the greeter positions which would be the ones that uh, check in the kids uh and the parents at the front of the uh, uh location to the go into um the play area yeah it was a really it was a it was a fun time it was back in 96 that we interviewed we opened in 97 uh february 21st and um yeah, it was, it was it was a fun time uh we had a lot of people that were uh, uh i mean michael eisner was there a bunch to uh kind of oversee uh the uh, uh what was going on and there was a lot of hype going into it and i think they had this um expectations almost like the field of dreams like if we build it they will come so they like actually purposely uh talking to the, the people that were in in charge at the time not really doing a lot in the way of promotion and um advertising they just thought it was enough to just say like you know disney was going to open up this uh uh you know children's play area and the, and the hype would you would 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 follow and it never really it never really did i mean like we uh um we were always busy uh when school was out you know so uh, like if it was a weekends uh parties birthday parties there was a uh, was a huge business um so those were always popular and during like spring breaks, summer vacations, it was fairly busy. But I mean, it was, you know, during the week, it was like, you know, uh, not that busy. And it's hard to operate a, uh, you know, successful business model when you're only busy, like, you know, two out of, you know, uh, the seven days in a week. Um, but it was uh, the cast was uh, uh, we were always excited about it. And it was always something new and changing. It was different. And a lot of things that we would pivot and kind of adjust along the way uh, to kind of meet the needs of the not only like the business, but also like we, they definitely strive to be very specific to the local environment. And I know at the time they picked Thousand Oaks specifically because it was like a growing uh, family uh, area and an area that uh, uh, no was known to have money. Um, the birthday parties, you know, I think they started at 250 bucks for like 12 kids and just kind of like went on from there. And there were times where there are parents spending thousands of dollars to host their like kids to your old birthday party at, uh, you know, club Disney. So it was, that part was, uh, was, was crazy. And, um, things that they had kind of developed there that, you know, I ended up seeing at the parks later that really did start at club Disney were like the, a lot of the headbands, like a lot of the headwear was things that were, those were things that were part of the, um, party favors for kids. So if they had like a Winnie the Pooh birthday party, they'd have uh, you know, assortment of like your ears and Pooh ears and ticker ears that, uh, that the kids would wear. And, you know, they still sell those in the parks today, but that's something that start actually started at, uh, at club Disney's is party favors. Yeah. And so what were you to, to take, to backtrack just a bit, what were you doing before club Disney? Were you with Disney and then you interviewed for this position or were you not, were you out of Disney? Uh, no, I was with Disney. Uh, I was uh, a part-time uh, cast member at uh, Disney stores. I mean, at the time I was like 18 years old. Um, so I was with uh, 
um, Disney stores. I opened the Thousand Oaks Disney store um, uh, for that location. So that was myself and in, in, in a handful of my uh, uh, friends that uh, opened the Thousand Oaks Disney store. We also then turned out to open the Thousand Oaks Club Disney location, which I think, you know, helped put us in a position to uh, uh, get the jobs because they, you know, they knew that we already had gone through one, you know, grand opening with uh, with Disney. So it, uh, you know, helped kind of being part of that for the opening cast. Um, but yeah, so I was with Disney at the time and there was about, I don't know, maybe a dozen of us that transferred over uh, and then the rest were all external hires through job fairs. Was it, was it at the time, was the Disney store still the lucrative concept they originally thought it was going to be? Yeah, this was before uh, Disney. I think really what uh, uh, what shifted for Disney at the time was they started uh, at this at, at that time, Disney store was really the only location you could go outside of like the parks to find Disney merchandise. And so this is like this is around the time that was definitely still within their heyday before Disney consumer products started unleashing more of their stuff in other stores like Walmarts and Targets and so on and so forth. And I think that was really kind of like the downfall of, uh, you know, the time with Disney store, because at that point, anybody could get a Disney, a Mickey t-shirt anywhere. Um, and so some of the, kind of the specialness came away. But at this time, yeah, this is definitely where it was still the heyday of the Disney stores. Like we would have, you know, character events. We would have, um, I remember one time we actually hosted a uh, Disney animation art event at our Disney stores after hours. And we actually had uh, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston were, were there to, uh, you know, greet people and, uh you know sign you know uh you know autographs and stuff uh we had a lot of character events i mean this is definitely during the peak i know that the stores outside that are still operating in you know malls should they still be open like they don't do any events like that barely ever if at all right i mean also at this time i don't even, i don't even know if the, if the disney stores still do this but at the time they still had these uh national disney trivia competitions for just uh disney cast members where you would they would actually take eight of the top scoring cast members in the country, like wherever you were from and then fly that fly them out to uh, California to uh, then compete at Disneyland in a big kind of like trivia competition, um, which I actually w- did uh, one year. Um, uh, but it was, uh, it was, it was definitely a big deal. And, and uh, slowly, but surely like, you know, you know, you know, more things are kind of you know going away um, over time. But I mean, I, by the time I transferred from the Disney store to club Disney, uh, Disney store at that, at that point was still uh, a big deal. Um, so it was like, yeah, kind of def- definitely, it was like maybe a couple of years before the Disney store started to do their slide. And so you interviewed for club Disney and what was your exact position again? Sorry. Uh, when we first opened, I was, uh, actually as an a- activity coordinator, which is one of the people that worked within the play area of the, uh, of, Club Disney. So like on the different, like the, there was like the jungle climber, which was a, you know, three story uh, climbing structure uh, that was somewhat themed to the Lion King. I mean, the theming at that point is definitely like in air quotes, because um, I think one of the, the criticisms uh, is, was in some of these areas, it wasn't as Disney fied as I think the, as the, the, the public or guests have what based on ex- their expectations. And I think in this particular case, you know, Disney's its own worst enemy. They, uh, in the in the sense where you 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 build these expectations of the theming and the, and, and and what they're going to do. And, these, and the Club Disney concept, um, while a good concept, uh, you know, there were some areas where it's just kind of a little lacking in the Disney uh, side of things, of where people associate like the you know the the, the magic of it. But uh, um, but the little Winnie the Pooh area, you know, for you know for little kids was was great. It was it was really well themed not a lot in the way of activities. And so it was always this kind of like, I think identity crisis that the, uh, that the club kind of experienced Uh, like the sweet spot, honestly, was like, if you were age five to seven, it was like a great place to, uh, uh, to go and be because you could go to the Applaudville theater and dress up and, you know, different Disney characters and be part of the fashion show. They would have like dance parties. Um, There was arts and crafts areas. There was, uh, uh, you know, computer areas and the mouse pad um the jungle climber but it was like if you were like teetering on the older side of things you kind of aged out of what they were going for if you're too little there wasn't a lot really that you could do um and their structure at the time it was under one was free when we actually when we first opened it was eight it was eight dollars all across the board um for adults and kids and there was a lot of criticism from adults saying like why am i paying you know money to go just literally babysit you know my my kids in there because there really wasn't things for like adults to do um, so then they kind of address that by uh, lowering the adult admission to $4. 
Um, but it's like different stuff, like socks were always required. I mean, so that was always, you know, kind of an issue. There's always uh, issues when we would occasionally uh, lose a pair of shoes every now and then, you know, as far as like when people would check things in and somebody wouldn't enter the the, the, the code properly. So it was always a, a fun thing to kind of, you know, maneuver. But um, but it was, it was a really like a, for the cast members, I mean, it was a great concept. Like everybody loved it. And even like to this day, like all of us are still, friends and have kids of our own have always said like wow i mean it would be great if something like that still existed because um you know it'd be great to take our kids too but again it was all that sweet spot like it was really like five to seven was the perfect age for this place yeah and so you know when i'm researching this i'm trying to figure out um the hardest thing of course is public perception because you can read the papers and you can read um, the news, like interviews at the time and trying to figure out, you know, what what did people think of Club Disney? Um, and besides, you know, the, the general complaints, you know, from the malls that they and the uh, and parents having to pay. It did seem as though when it closed, especially people were pretty upset. Like it was definitely a place that some people really came to love. Oh, for sure. I mean, like uh, one thing that they had uh, introduced not right away when we opened, but a little later on was kind of like an annual pass, uh, you know, for uh, families. And it was, uh, it was, you know, it was reduced, you know, you know, price. So, uh, so if you literally, I think at the time, if you went more than, you know, once a week, it like more than paid for, you know, itself. And so there were some people that were, that was, you know, their thing that would come, you know, every time after school, like once homework was done and we would recognize, you know, those uh, those families that came in. We also had a lot of several uh, celebrities that were that were frequently uh, coming to Club Disney too, bringing their kids. Like who? Um, Will Smith uh, <laughs> came. Yeah, came came quite often. Uh, no way. It, I mean, wait, yeah. So Will Smith. Right. <laughs> so, uh, like, so I mean, it got to the point where Jada was coming more often than than Will was because this was. When we opened, I mean, Will Smith was like popular, but it was like right before, like once like Men in Black opened, like it was like at that point was like it catapulted him like next level amongst kids. So there was a time that I actually had to uh, escort Will Smith out because he was like at that point he had to hold himself up in the men's restroom to kind of get away from like the swarm of kids who were trying to like, you know, just get around him. And also other parents were also trying to like, you know, uh, um, you get a chance to meet him. So I... Uh, I had to go into like the restroom, make sure he was ready to go and escorted him like out through a side entrance, just kind of like, get him away from the craziness. So that was, I mean, prior to that, he'd, he'd, he'd come like quite a few times, but after that incident, we never actually, at least I never saw him uh, come again, but uh, uh, Jada and his kids came a bunch. They had the pass. Um, Sinbad brought his kids a bunch. Um, <laughs> I love, I, you know, I forget. I mean, please keep thinking and listing, but I mean, every name is just like, what? <laughs> because it's, yeah, it's not like you're not saying current celebrities, of course, because it wasn't, it's not a, it's not modern. This happened in the mid nineties. So it's just so funny just hearing, oh, you know, Will Smith's and bad, like all these, all these names. It's just, yeah, it totally. immediately takes me back. So please. Um, as far as people that were like, they were like there regularly, uh, David Hasselhoff was there a bunch. Um, uh, Gary Sinise was there a lot with his kids. Um, who else? Uh, uh, Patrick Warburton, you know, from, you know, Kronk, um, from Soren. Yeah. 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 So he was, uh, Oh, Hulk, Hulk Hogan was another one. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I have to remember that this is in thousand Oaks, which is a, is it a wealthy suburb of Los Angeles? Uh, is yeah, that right? it's, yeah, it's pretty affluent. I mean, there's, there, there's, there's areas that are, uh, um, uh, that are more affluent than others. Uh, but yeah, these are all people that like lived, you know, in the area and they had kids. And, and, the, and the fact that it was um, people, a lot of people for the most part, I mean, like I said, the, the Will Smith example was the only one that were, you know, it, it ever got like really crazy. Um, Wait, no one swarmed Sinbad? No, nah, everyone else was just kind of like, just pretty like chill and just let everybody kind of like be. And like, you know, occasionally people would like approach, you know, you know, them and they would just, uh, you know, uh, you know, blow it off. I mean, actually, I, I re there was one time when I was up at the greeter station. Um, at this point, I was, at that time, I was a supervisor and uh, uh, Jada was checking in with her kids right at the same time that Sinbad was. And they were like, Sinbad's are like pitching her a concept for like a, uh, like a, like a movie and like, oh, it sounds good. Like, let me know about it. I'm just like, Okay. Uh, meanwhile, eight dollars for your kids. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was wild. But there was a lot of people that did have a lot of love. I mean, to, back to your original question um, for the concept, and there were people that I still remember that 
were there all the time. These two kids, they wanted, they wanted to be the, like the last ones out. Like they want to have the distinction of being like the last kids to ever, um, be at a club Disney. And they were there all the time. Um, and so we closed, it was, uh, Halloween. Uh, it was the day that we, uh, the day that we closed and, uh, they, they hung back They waited for everybody else to kind of leave. Um, so they'd be the last ones we'd like, uh, and I was the one that actually got to snip their, uh, their wristbands off that everybody had to wear. Um, so it was, it was a really like special concept for those that opened it for sure. Um, and then for a lot of guests that came, loved it. It definitely had its criticisms and rightly so, but there were, there were a lot of people that loved it. And then like towards the end, like when we were closing, we had crazy lines to get in. And a lot of people, you know, had said like, I didn't even know this place existed till I read that they were closing, you know? And so, um, again, I think there was, uh, just a mismanagement uh, of trying to like get the word out about the concepts. And, you know, they tried to have, I think what you mentioned on your podcast, uh, these, you know, adventures that we would uh, do for like, you know, groups for kids. And that just really never took off. So like, you know, when it was during the week school, you get like a few, you know, mommy and me kind of situations where like they bring like young kids in who are too young for school, but like, it would be a ghost town, you know, until um, maybe after school was out and you get like a small influx of people. But, the weekends were packed. Like I said, the birthday parties were a huge um, revenue stream for uh, 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 for Club Disney. So those were super popular. We had five locations that were open. They were supposed to be a, you know a huge expansion because the Disney Regional Entertainment, like their um, philosophy, was to bring the Disney experience to uh, urban areas and other seri- areas without within the United States so that was not just Anaheim or Orlando. Um, so, you know, they, and they were targeting areas that, uh, were somewhat similar to Thousand Oaks mock-up. So like in, uh, like Chandler, Arizona, from what I understand was, you know, was similar, uh, where they opened in, in Colorado was also kind of a similar area. They purposefully opened in West Covina to give a completely different demographic, uh, to see well, how it would do out there. Um, and, you know, it really had kind of like almost like the same uh, results, you know, again, you know, busy on the weekends, not so much during the week. But uh, for our location, you uh, when you first walked in, like the general area where you did not have to have a wristband or paid admission to go in, there was the store um, and just kind of really just envision a small version of a Disney store. Like we wanted Disney store. It's called the club shop, but it was a bit same type of um, products. Uh, some things we had, there were some exclusive to Club Disney as far as T-shirts and what have you. Um, around this time was also when the Disney stores and Disney was experiencing the whole like Beanie Baby craze. Um, oh, right. The Bitcoin of the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, so we tried to like cash in on that. So um, we had a few uh, Beanie Babies or exclusive to just Club Disney. Uh, one of which being Merlin, because Merlin was kind of like our unofficial mascot because he was the person that the kids would interact with at, during the birthday parties. Like they would go in and they would have um, to kind of like I, we can go through the birthday parties stuff later if you want to get into it. But um, but he was kind of like the unofficial mascot. So we had like a Merlin beanie baby and like we would have to all deal with the same kind of crazies that came into any other Disney store, like people looking for like unbent tags and like inspecting them practically with like, uh, you know, uh, through a magnifying glass. I mean, just ridiculous. But uh, so that was the general. St- so the general area you go into was it was the retail store or then the general lobby, which you'd have the check in desk where you would go in to uh pay for admission turn your shoes in get your wristbands and all the wristbands were coded specifically to that family so only those kids could leave with the adults that were with them and uh then there would also be a separate area that was just for birthday parties like a, like a staging area for groups to like check-ins it was there was a separate check-in desk that we had for uh birthday party guests and then a staging area where those kids would gather and then they'd all go in as a group before you keep going i'm just trying to get the layout of my mind so this is attached to the thousand oaks mall but this is not an interior entrance this is an exterior entrance correct uh this is all interior yeah so so you so you so you enter from the main mall area yeah well so where we were was that we were a freestanding building so we were in a um we were in this this new uh, and it was it, at the time it was this newly developed shopping outdoor shopping center, part of like the Caruso group. 
Yeah, so it's an outdoor shopping center. So yeah, I'm imagining, you know, a a large shopping complex that's indoors, like an indoor shopping mall. But this is yeah. I saw the I saw the exterior. So that it's a freestanding building, and so you're walking inside. Okay, got it. That's just trying to get that straight. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So like so within this outdoor shopping center, we were oh, a completely separate freestanding building uh, for just this uh, uh, Club Disney. So you would uh, uh, so you would enter into the building and you would either have your retail component, uh, which had its own entrance and exit on its own, or it was attached to the general lobby. And then the general lobby would be where you would check in to uh, either just play for the day or separately go to another area to check in for birthday parties. Um, so once you had your wristbands, you're ready to go. Then there was uh, you'd go through a gate where there would be a cast member there checking, you know, wristbands to make sure that things, you know, people had admission to go inside. Once you entered, the first thing you would see straight ahead would be the jungle climber. That was a three-story climbing structure with a big kind of like a, a tube slide that went from the top down to the bottom. Um, then we would have to the right of that was, uh, and, and, and just before the jungle climber, but to the right was the Winnie the Pooh area. And think of like, it was very like, uh, you know, it felt very like you were in, in, in the Hundred Acre Wood. I mean, for give you that kind of like color palette. There would be like a few uh, logs that kids could like climb through, climb on a little area, kind of like Pooh's house, uh, like a little mock-up play, kind of like kitchen area that was like uh, that was you know geared to like Winnie the Pooh. There would be like a little area that like supposed to be like Rabbit's Garden, where they'd have like these uh, you know plastic uh, uh, carrots you would like pull in and out like you were gardening. Okay, so the, some clubs describe this as the Pooh and You corner, right? Correct. Did yours? I'm trying to think. I feel like at the time we did not call it Pooh and You. I think it was called, I think we just called it Pooh's Corner, but I, I mean, we're also going back 20 years ago. Right. But this is for the little kids though, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so they, they were like be areas that there was like designated, like this was like more from like the zero to two category. You know, we, we'd like to say like the Jungle Climber was geared more for like, you know, like four to 10, you know, like we, they try to like, you know, break it out to like age to kind of give like, you know, you know, guests and parents a a sense of like where they should be playing. So the ones that were specifically for kids, there was, it was the Winnie the Pooh area. And then there was an area, I think it was, I think we called it Dumbo Circus, but basically it was like a, a little like climbing wooden train area um, that the, like that the kids, like little kids could like play uh, along on this like train. It was all kind of like themed to like a circus, Um, not a large area, um, but it was like an area again, that was designated just to them. And then, and you would have cast members in all these areas that were uh, making sure that they were kind of like it wasn't like the kids who were older necessarily couldn't go in, but they were making sure that like the the the, the bigger kids were like respecting the fact that these areas were for smaller kids, so that kids wouldn't get uh, you know hurt or injured along the way. Well, did you have a ball pit? Uh, we did not have a we did not have a ball pit in the jungle climber that I can remember well you would have remembered because you would have been cleaning puke out of it so yeah i mean and they, 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 and they also i mean i think that was i mean there were definitely like uh things we had to clean in the tunnel slide often um you know from kids having accidents but um we would just have to like shut the uh shut the, the slide down and somebody would have to like literally draw straws of who's going to climb in there with you know disinfectant and uh you know clean the uh you know clean the slide real quick on this uh you know I, I take some shots at the uh, the typical Disney annual pass holder, um, and they're uh, they, they you know they think they have the you know the right to do whatever they want. Like especially Disney World, I don't know if you've oh, sure. um, experienced this in Florida. Yeah, they they uh, because they have an annual pass, they can do whatever they want and uh, yell at any cast members. I think it would be awesome if there were adults. I mean, Disney World makes sense. I'm mean, Walt Disney World makes sense, and so does Disneyland because there's a lot of stuff for adults only, and you know all ages. But I think it'd be hilarious if you had annual pass holders for Club Disney that just are adults and they're, you know, they're like <laughs> taking craps in the slides. They're like, I know that the cast members clean this up and I paid for it. And they're just like, right. you know, just you, they're they're putting on the little princess dresses in the Applaudville Theater. And, oh, for sure. Um, totally taking advantage of it. Yeah. We actually also had they, there were like uh, um, they they tried to have, uh, you know, things that were for like adults, you know, to um <laughs> So, I mean, so there was one area upstairs called it. So there was, uh, you have to imagine. Uh, so when you walked in, there was this uh, big cone shaped that made it look like Mickey's sorcerer's hat that, that, that housed the mouse pad. So inside the hat was where the computers were. And they were all, you know, this was not freewheeling like internet. They were like pre-programmed 
stations that had all like Disney interactive like games that were like loaded in there um, that the kids could play. But at the top of this, so there was so Club Disney, our location was a two story facility. So there was the general floor downstairs that had all the play areas. Also, the, the, the cafe was downstairs. And then upstairs was where the, where the birthday party rooms were. But there was also this area called the chat hat, which was like supposed to be like this like adult lounge where adults could hang out. But it wasn't like, you know, there was like beer, alcohol, wine, like any type of cocktails are being like served within like the club. Um, so like nobody really like hung up there. Occasionally you'd have a couple of people that would hang out. Most adults usually just hung out in the um in the in the cafe area like they made like to like snack on like you know like food or fries and actually the food at our location was actually good like we were all kind of like pleasantly surprised with the quality of the food um because obviously not not a lot of times when you think uh you know the theme parks you think of like you know uh you know quality food and beverage um but uh well, lo- more like when you think of chuck e cheese you don't think of- well even more so and but the one of the rules was you if you were an adult you had to come in with a kid Yes. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, so you had to find a child before you could experience the chat hat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, a willing child that wants to come to Club Disney, which yes. is probably a lot. So it's not that hard. A yeah. relative, a nephew or a niece or something. And so that was that. Did that ever cause problems? Was there ever a situation where an adult just wanted to check it out? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there was definitely a more than one occasion where like you would have adults come in and be like a little annoyed. They couldn't just like, you know, check it out. And that's also that at this time, there's also pre um you know, people who are like, you know, you know, you know, bloggers and had like websites, and all this kind of stuff, because obviously nowadays, I mean, you know, there's so many things that people like just taking pictures of like, like oh, those podcasters that talk about extinct Disney, right? Yeah, that exactly. Worst. You know, no, the, the ones the ones I laugh at are the ones where like, you know, they take a picture of like a like a crack that was like, you know, recently filled in some, you know, corner of like Disneyland, like, oh, it finally got fixed. It's like, uh, okay. You know, but, um, <laughs> but you have, uh, you for sure had a lot of adults that would come in who would want to just kind of check it out. Just kind of like, you know, out of curiosity, we'd have to explain to them, you know, unfortunately, it's, you know, I'm stop. Now, did your location now, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting and no, jumping around. No, go for it. There was also in some locations, the, um, super Calatuntastic, whatchamacallimate time toaster. I memorized this. Was that in your location? That was not. Okay. I'm not too sure which location that was. In. So you had the jungle climber, and this was post uh, uh, Lion King. So, and you're you're we're creeping into Hercules and Tarzan and all that stuff. So we're gonna we'll get into characters, but sorry. So we're your tour right now. We are in the chat hat and the the lunch area. So what did what was served? Um, we had the so we did have the Mickey shaped pizzas. Like you either could get them as individual or you could get like a family size. Um, they had you know. Typical fare as far as like, uh, uh, you know, French fries, you know, chicken strips. They're, they try to like do some healthier stuff, like different, you know, like, you know, gourmet salads and sandwiches. Um, the desserts were all uh, through a partnership with um, Cheesecake Factory. So uh, they created the birthday cakes for us uh, for the birthday parties. Were they were they cheesecakes? No, they're actually like a, as far as like, you know, flour based uh, cakes. So either like vanilla or chocolate. And they were delicious i mean they were delicious cakes right i can imagine i I mean cheesecake factory shout out to cheesecake factory delicious food terrible theming cheesecake factory i think that's their slogan yeah yeah and they're actually they're um and their corporate headquarters as far as it was uh uh for cheesecake factory is not far from the thousand Oaks location i mean they were i mean they probably were i mean it's a 15 minute drive um because of the area and because of the clientele they uh and these birthday parties, they wanted to make sure they were justifying the two hundred fifty dollars price tag, and it wasn't just going to be like some sheet cake from like you know a local supermarket. So uh, it was like, and so not only on these cakes were they like made by Cheesecake Factory, but there's also these like small chocolate discs that had the character or some sort of emblem theme to the party that would go onto the disc to make it specific. And then you would have the uh, party coordinators uh, and the party prep people would then and then hand uh, a pipe you know, happy birthday with the kid's name onto the cake itself. A pipe? Like they would hand pipe like icing, you know, onto like a colored frosting onto the cake. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. I thought you, they like, they like, here's a piece of cheesecake from the cheesecake factory. Here's a pipe. Oh yeah. It's your birthday. Yeah. yeah enjoy. <laughs> your, yeah. Here's, a, here's a cigar kid. It's your birthday. Let's, let's have, have a smoke out on the balcony. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, we're, we're talking about before we get into the birthday parties, which is a, you know, probably, as you said, I guess, true, as you said, your main business, because that's a huge event. 
Um, but the, before we get away from that, your Mickey Mouse pizza. I don't know if you've ever seen this quote in the newspaper, but I'm going to read it to you. Um, this is uh, a quote from, um, hey, I forget what newspaper it is. I should have written it down. But this is a wonderful quote from a young girl who had tried Mickey Mouse pizza at the Thousand Oaks location. So probably L.A. Times. Um, so here we go. Ready? Uh, the best way to eat a Mickey Mouse pizza, according to three year old Haley Goldberg, is to nibble the cheese off the mouse ears first, spread the sauce evenly across the chin, then devour the crust by making a hole in the middle and working your way out, which is probably the most violent thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and very specific. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, she's thought about this too much. Um, and so were the Mickey Mouse pizzas made for individual use? Or is she devouring a large pizza? Yeah, we had both. I mean, so, um, yeah, and I don't remember, like, the price points, but let's just say, like, uh, uh, I want to say it was something like in a neighborhood of, like, you know, seven bucks for a personal or it's going to be, like, 25 for, like, the family or something. Um, and they had different, uh, you know, flavors. They had your standard, your cheese, your pepperoni. We also had a, uh, a barbecue chicken pizza. Um, and then they started to branch out to try other things at one point they had like a cheeseburger pizza which would be they'd use like ground beef they'd use like you know uh ketchup as the base versus like tomato sauce and like use more like american kind of like cheese uh and then like put like pickles on top I and mean, so it actually tasted like a cheeseburger the food was was very good i mean like it was it was one that uh um the mickey shape pizzas even now like we every now and then like i said like some of the, my buddies who uh you know we used to work there and be like you know you know damn that that was good pizza i mean like it was it was actually i mean it was uh all made you know in-house i mean it was they, they did stuff from scratch i mean it was uh um it was definitely an area that was not being like phoned in it was uh it was uh good quality food so where was this in relation to the rest so was this a separate cafeteria area than the rest of the club i mean it was all within the uh ticketed admission area i mean yeah so like if if you to take you through like back to like kind of like to the beginning so if you went through the first gate uh to your left would be the start of the uh mickey sorcerer hat which inside would be the mouse pad the computer area and then right to your right would be the winnie the pooh area straight ahead would be the jungle climber so the first level had all these like different kind of uh different skill games i mean think of like in the sense of like a you know ski ball air hockey foosball kind of thing there was like themes there was like a mighty duck themed air hockey table um you know there would be different uh um disney themed games kind of like that for like kids that broke down constantly um then there was like two ways you could access a jungle climber there's like a climbing tube in the center of the first floor that you could climb up or there was like stairs that you could take you know for like you know adults or whoever didn't want to go through the climbing tube and then within that, there was two different layers that had just a different like climbing tubes, different kind of activities the kids could like play with, you know, more like soft foam kind of thing. Um, but it wasn't like they, they'd play like the soundtrack from The Lion King within that area. There would be like color palettes that would be similar, but it wasn't like there was all these, you know, uh, three dimensional like Lion King characters that were, inter that were interspersed in any of this. I and mean, there wasn't any of that um so it was like you know in air quotes it was themed to the lion king but it wasn't like a full theming within this jungle climber area but the you know the big you know the big thing that people uh gravitated towards was the slide i mean the kids love the slide and you would it would be manned with somebody at the top somebody at the bottom with walkie talkies let them know when the slide was clear to send the next kid down um so that was uh something that was always you know manned and monitored to make sure the kids weren't going out of control and people weren't getting hurt you know going down uh there was a height requirement there also was a height limit i think you know to the to the slide um so that was a slide itself and then uh to the if you kind of like that pushes towards the back of the uh of the space and so along that wall if you would because go keep going like outer perimeter um would be the uh Dumbo Circus area that I was telling you about before, like little train, more for like little kids. There was an area that was called Animation Station. When we first opened, it was uh, you would teach kids how to do stop motion animation based on you would have uh, different bendable, posable uh, figures and a camera that you would uh, you know click along the way. You would teach them how to do stop motion. You could play it back for the kids to see how, like how they had created the animation. Um, again, it was one that. 
uh, for older kids, uh, some enjoyed it. Some would start getting bored, or they would, you know, they wouldn't have the patience for it. So later, that area was rethemed to like a Peter Pan's shadow, where they would they went in and, and, and on the walls they had put this uh, um, this paint or wallpaper that when you expose it to light, it would like capture the image on the wall. So you would have all these kids, and there, there were different like props you could put on. So they would like, you know, they would, they would be like a countdown to when the, 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 the camera would flash and you would strike a pose on the wall and it would, it would hold that image on the wall for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. It would, at that point, light would just, you know, take itself back over again and then you'd start all over again. Um, the next room after that was character creations, which was where they would do all the arts and crafts. And that was more a timed event uh, so that you would have like, it would be t- like postings of like what the character or craft was going to be on that particular day what time was going to start um and it was usually about like a 20 30 minute thing all the materials were provided you know and um it started more elaborate when we first opened and kind of kept on continually kind of slightly dumbing down just based on like time and cost and to the point where like it was some sometimes just like coloring sheets where when we first opened it was like pretty like elaborate uh um projects that they would make to the point where they'd have to like the kids would have to come back like a half hour later after like it would dry it or or whatever to then pick it back up again um but the cast members in there were always like you know great and you know and well trained and, and, and awesome with the kids um and then beyond that it kind of like opened up to a general kind of uh area so then within the center of Club Disney, uh, you'd have the Applaudville Theater, uh, which all of the uh, performers that were hired for that. And, you know, that was the only area within the club that was also um, union based, based on the fact that they were uh, it was uh, like more like equity, equity actors uh, within that area. So they were the like the MCs for the um, the dance parties and they were the, the ones who were leading the fashion shows and there were storytelling that was happening and with like, you know, they would get in full character and, and, and do a bunch of different voices. And these same actors were also then in some cases were uh, Merlin up in the birthday party area. And there was one other structure that we, uh, that was more of a rotating theme. It was, it was like, there was a little small like villains maze at the bottom. And it was, it, it was very small. It was not large. It was like little like villains theme maze that kids would go through. And at the top of this um, was the area they'd always kind of re-theme to whatever the newest like Disney film was coming out at the time. So like when Hercules came out, it was uh, turned into like a small little like Herc's gym area. When Tarzan came out, they had like a little it was more like themed to more like a jungle. So that was the one area they tried to always kind of keep somewhat current and synergistic to whatever the, the latest Disney film was. Um, and then for the rest of the downstairs was just the, uh, the club cafe. And then there would be, uh, down that uh, hallway would be, uh, restrooms and the rest was all just, uh, backstage stuff for cast members. And then, um, upstairs, like I said, there was the chat hat for adults and the rest were all, uh, birthday party rooms. There were four different rooms that were themed, um, to the various parties so there was uh the the core birthday parties that never changed we always had a princess tea party um there was a winnie the pooh theme party um but then they had something that would like rotate again based on the the like the whatever the new films were they try to make you know make things like current so at one point there was like a dalmatian theme party at one point there was a hercules party there was a uh a uh, Toy Story party. There was a uh, Bugs Life party, um, and I think I read that somewhere it was like for the Toy Story party, the they had starring, and then you'd have an actor come and portray a very specific character, right? Uh, right. So I mean, so like the the uh, the way it would work is like they they were the the birthday party specialist would always have like themed vests to the party, um, but they never like assumed the role of a character so it wasn't like so if you had like a um toy story party it wasn't like the the person leading your party is like a green army man or something like it would just be like one of the uh party consultants but they're like the vest itself would be you know like uh andy's uh uh you know bedroom pattern like the like the like the clouds and like the you know in the in the, in the blue really okay again sorry to interrupt but the no go ahead I, i'm just trying to get this straight because the the advertisements i found said like princess tea party starring snow white and then it would say like uh toy story search party starring the gr- the army men or something like that so this wasn't 
the when it said what did it mean by starring the army men starring snow white what what where was that implemented uh, it, it wasn't i mean like i mean there there wasn't uh i mean there was there wasn't any um there wasn't any the only like the only disney character that anybody ever interacted with for the birthday parties and pretty much any time uh, we did have a couple of like rando events where they had like a, we had a couple of uh buyouts where we had like uh, like kind of like a like a theme sleepover at the club um a couple of times where we actually had like Disney characters and like if there was a new Disney film coming out, there might be like a weekend where like come meet Hercules and Meg, you know, if, if, if that was like the big thing. But that was not associated with the birthday parties. The only uh, character they would specifically interact with uh, for the birthday parties was Merlin. And basically how the party would work is the first hour was general play. The second hour would be upstairs in the party room and the party room inside would be, you know, would be themed, you know, somewhat specifically, somewhat kind of generically um, to uh, that birthday party. So the princess room, the only parties held, held in the princess room was the princess room because you go inside, it was like pinks and it was purples and it was like murals of like, um, you know, the castle and, you know, and, and, you know, different princess stuff. The girls uh, at the party would get like tiaras, you know, um, to, you know, to wear, um, you know, all of the paper products and paper goods were all, you know, themed, it was, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to the party. Again, I talked about the chocolate cakes. So like when the cake came out, there would be like on the discs on the party would be like a glass slipper, you know, so those kind of like touches. Um, they'd play like the party consultant would play like different like games and, and you know, and the, and the music would all be themed within the room to that party. But at some point they, they would then go out uh, to go visit Merlin. And basically what Merlin would do, so he would be, uh, and, you know, actor interacting with the kids, you very, make it very specific to, um, the birthday child. And then he would conjure up Mickey in, uh, his, oh, I just, yeah, I'm totally blind, like on his, like his glass, like ball, like as far as like, you know, like to, to, to have him like, you know, have him like magically like appear. And then Mickey would wish through, um, the ball, you know, wish the, the, the child like a happy birthday. And then at that point, they, oh, that's the saddest thing I've ever heard. Yeah, and at that point, it was base. It was basically like at that point done. Like they would they would go back to the party, you know, kind of you know collect the last remaining things. They would never open gifts uh, there because that would slow things down. So all the gifts would be checked in. We would keep those staged and give you know give them to the guests on the way out. This was uh, for this for this uh, you know this area for these parents. I mean, very bougie birthday parties. I mean, like I said, there was uh, um, these kids' parties were pretty elaborate. I mean. Um, uh, what because there's different like add-ons and pluses you could you could upgrade like the the party favors you could add on additional play time you could you know add on additional you know little things here and there they'd all have you know themed invitations that we would you know give the guests to send out and there would be like you know puzzles or whatever the case you know would be for you know for the for the invitations but uh um yeah the birthday parties were a big thing like we would on weekends it would be packed you know and we would uh it would literally just be churning over birthday party rooms just constantly through on on over the weekends um but it was uh it was that that was definitely one of those you know popular businesses you know that we had was the birthday parties right and so i'm just trying to i mean so merlin um i'm sure that that, that was a great actor that played merlin but when in my mind when you know you i having never been to club disney and trying to imagine a 90s era disney play place that really wasn't advertised that well and more or less a money grab. I mean, I don't think it was a passion thing for um, the executives that greenlighted it. Of course, good work was put into it, as with most things, right? Um, but it wasn't like a a like oh we just we just want everybody to come flock here. Like it was, you know, like you said at the beginning, we expect people to. But you know, with all that in mind, the picture that I'm getting now of Merlin <laughs> just being like, "Hey, kids," yeah. <laughs> and, um, in that big, probably terribly, like you know, probably can see the straps around the ears, beard, and just be like, "Hey, kids, you want to talk to Mickey?" And he just like brings a little ball. He's like, Mickey's like, "Happy birthday!" And then he's like, "Okay," and you put it away. It's like that's that's it. Happy birthday! Now leave. Don't open your presents. Yeah, here. I mean, thank. I mean, thankfully, it was not uh, <laughs> not that bad. That yeah. bad. No, I, I I get it. I get it. It's just that's the image. For sure. that- uh- I am given. Yeah, I mean, I mean the uh, uh, the pro- performers that did uh, Merlin, they they all did like really like phenomenal jobs. The makeup, you know, was was good. It was it was definitely uh, above you know stapling a fake beard to someone's face and then like just you know coming out there and having like an old man voice. Um, there was it was definitely s- largely scripted with you know some opportunity for for it to be like specifically tied to that particular birthday child. Um, 
they would do like a magic trick or two, like as far as like to like interact like with the kids. I mean, it was I think the entire Merlin again. You're just conjuring sad images. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> when you say like, and then Merlin does a magic trick, he's like, "Hey, pick a card. Let me see it. It's four clubs." And he's like, "I'm out of here. Don't open your presents." Not as sad as it sounds, uh, but I hear I, I hear you. As far as Club Disney goes, what were some of the complaints and then i want your top stories uh bizarre things things that stood out to you like events i mean other than you know having to rescue will smith from a bathroom i think you might have peaked with that <laughs> one um but uh but other than that you know so first let's just start on what were some of the main we know that you know people loved the probably the the uh how it was more low-key than the theme parks but how it still had some disney um magic implemented into it and you know dropping prices helped so we know kind of what people liked and what was there but what was some of the com- major complaints the biggest one which we already kind of talked about like for most was just the fact that like parents had to pay and that parents had to be there you know and and um you know, because obviously we didn't want to have the place of just being like a, you know, a place where you just drop your kids off. And like now we're like the babysitters, like any Cedar Fair Park. Yeah, exactly. So um, so I mean, that was like probably the, the biggest complaint was just the uh, admission prices in regards to adults. And like I said, when we first opened, it was just an even eight dollars for everybody across the board. So they at least lowered it to four, you know, for the adults. The fact that we char- started charging full price at one years of age, you know, was, uh, you know, I mean, and it would be hard for, you know, myself or any cast member to like with a straight face, try to justify to an adult why their one year old is paying the same amount for their as their eight year old. So the one year old is like going to only pick a couple of plastic carrots in, a, in, in you know, Pooh's area. And that's about it. I mean, so, you know, that was hard to kind of like enforce. We'd have to like sell socks I mean, a lot of people who'd come. They, didn't, they weren't prepared. There was going to be like a shoes off socks required situation. So that was always like a, a bit of a challenge. We had a strict no outside food policy um, and, uh, you know, we would try to do our best to make somewhat reasonable accommodations like for them. Like we'd offer to like, you know, um, store their food temporarily and like and have them take it someplace, you know, you know, else and like eat it out, like, you know, out in the you know overall like promenade area. But, you know, that we couldn't allow outside food. So that was sometimes a problem. And then, like I said, like in general, I think people just really kind of like were underwhelmed, you know, like, like I said, like when I said before, like, you know, a lot of people you have, you know, Disney's his own worst enemies. You have these people come in and expecting to have like the theming of, you know, Toontown or of, uh, um, you know, Indiana Jones adventure. And then you come in and like, that's it. Like, so it's, uh, I'm my kids picking plastic carrots out of a, you know, fake garden. And this is why I'm paying $27 for all of us to go in. Like, it it was that kind of like approach that I think is, you know, was kind of like the, uh, a letdown for a lot of people. But having said that, you know, we try to position ourselves or we, we refer to it as an a- imagination powered play site. So it was supposed to be like, you know, you're supposed to, as like, as a kid, like you're, you know, in a celebration of like the way they connect the dots, like, you know, like how, how a kid kind of sees things like is going to be differently than one adult, like adults, like, how does this work? Show me like, what's it going to do where a kid can obviously take, a block, you know, and turn that into something potentially magical. So there's that, maybe that, that disconnect, but at, at, at the end of the day, it's the adults that's paying, not the kids, you know? So it's, uh, you know, so I think a lot of, you know, it based on, you know, uh, there were adults that loved it if their kids loved it. So there were some kids who would show up and they would love it. And the other kids would show up and they would just be bored. They're like, is this it? Like I went down the slide, you know, five times and now there's nothing left for me to do, you know? And it was fair and valid complaints. Like, <laughs> um, so when we closed, it wasn't like a shock, you know, to any of us necessarily. Um, wasn't mean that didn't mean that we weren't disappointed. A lot of us were like emotionally invested in this, like in this concept. I mean, you know, we built friendships that even now today still exist, like, you know, 20, you know, plus years later. Um, you know, it was not surprising, you know, that when we like when they said that we were closing that uh, that we closed. Right. I mean, it's just it's just something that Disney was so I mean, Disney Regional Entertainment, literally the purpose of it was let's get out there. Let's, you know, make these small experiences. But part of what makes Disney so successful as a theme park is that they the attention and care and the making you feel like this is it. Like you are here. Right. You know what I mean? Like, um, like if you go to the magic, if you go to Disneyland, even the, in the magic kingdom as well, um, 
there's that that aura of this is what you've always dreamed of. This is the place. This is where everything is happening. And even Epcot, especially of the one that is the least Disney and Animal Kingdom at times. And I mean, Hollywood Studios, uh, Disney California Adventure, all of the secondary parks even have that trouble of trying to find their identity because people come, uh, especially so Epcot, for example, they'll ask, well, where's Disney World? It's like, well, you're in Disney World. Right. right. <laughs> like it's you're not at the Magic Kingdom. It's that even the secondary parks that are huge and that have everything going on and attention still always feel like they are not the place to be and that the kids always want to be at the big uh, Magic Kingdom style parks. And to even further remove that, take them into their local, you know, your own town, your local suburb and try to give them the same experience. It's always going to feel um, half of what it should be, even if it's, you know, given a lot of attention, which at times Club Disney wasn't um, by by the corporation. I mean, um, and it's always going to feel that same thing with Disney Quest. So it's just a, the entire concept just seemed to be um, flawed from the beginning when Disney is better off, you know, just really amping up their main locations rather than trying to spread themselves uh, thin. So that that does make sense. But I want to I do want to get into uh, your stories. So is there anything and, you know, of course, there, there might not be. But is there any stories that really states like days that you're like, wow, that was the that was the worst day or that was the best day. That's the funniest thing. That was like that was the most annoying thing. I mean, what are some of the big emotional highlights or stories you have? I mean, there were definitely, I mean, we had, a, I mean, we would, uh, our, our code for certain guests was like, we have an a, uh, HMG, which would be high maintenance guests. Like that would be like something like a code that we would use. Um, and it was definitely within that area it, They're you know, they're known to be uh, a lot of people. They're not exactly, um, you know, user friendly they never worked like a day in their life and they just expect everything to be done for them and have like certain demands so you know we would always have to like on a daily basis kind of deal with that type of guest and um there's not exactly one specific incident i can think of like right now like 20 plus years later that like really like necessarily stands out you know the one thing that i think that you know, for myself and all of us, like, do remember, like, there were the times where you would have, like, really just, like, great interactions, like, with the kids, like, you know, like, they would, uh, um, you know, they'd come in and have a great time. The ones that, like, really loved it, like, was, like, you know, a high for all of us. But again, we were constantly, like, kind of, like, adjusting and making changes along the way. At one point, um, the Thousand Oaks area, it's not a large, it's, it's not a huge uh, Jewish community, but there's definitely a... Um, a uh, significant percentage of people within the area that uh, uh, that are Jewish, and so there was one our first year that we were open for the character creations. We had uh, they were doing some sort of uh, kind of like a winter themed kind of project that had a Christmas tree on it, and that became like a huge issue. Uh, with a, a couple of people came in to complain to the point where like that we had to like scrap the. Um, uh, that project in the following year, they had made the decision to like, not acknowledge, uh, like the holidays really at all, which I, we always thought was hilarious because we're like, um, if you go into Disneyland, there's a 50 foot Christmas tree. The second you walk into like the, you know, the area, like, I mean, I mean, I don't, um, so it was like that kind of stuff. So, so, so wait, was someone was like happy holidays and you're like, what do you mean? Yeah, exactly. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, so like you don't even reference that it is a holiday season of multiple holidays of multiple faiths. That's funny. Happy normal times in December from Club Disney. So Club Disney was like the first battle or like the shot heard around the world of the war on Christmas. Yeah, yeah which, exactly. Like pe people, for some reason, think that this has been going on for like the past five years, even though you, you could probably find similar complaints for the past, you know, century it is, it is stuff like that, your day to day operations that had to be more, you're, you know, there's going to be more voices because there's less people and the management is more condensed. You know, if I mean, so people probably every year had complained that, oh, Disneyland is so Christmas time. I mean, it's Mickey's Christmas celebration, right? There's probably a large group of people that complain about that. But with something like Club Disney, it's much more accessible to get your voice heard. So it does make sense in a way. Well, for sure, especially if you're dealing with a, dis a business model that's still like trying to figure itself out and define itself. I mean, at that point, when you're not being, you know, lucrative and successful and you're looking for ways to turn it around like you're going to listen to anything and anybody and if you think that's the smoking gun that's going to like you know cause 
you know, uh, you know, a positive or negative one way or the other, you're going to make an adjustment, you know? And so there was a lot of that. There was a lot of, you know, things that were adjusted and, and, and changed along the, you know, along the way. Um, and just based on that kind of like, you know, that feedback. Yeah. And, uh, and so do you have anything else on club Disney before we move on to just a brief, brief, uh, little clip about, um, ESPN zone? I mean, as far as, like I said, club Disney, I mean, the, um, I think the intentions were there for all involved. I don't think anybody went into it like with the idea of like, you know what, let's make something underwhelming, you know, for the, you know, you know, for, you know, for the public, you know, but I think, you know, at this time, this also when like, you know, Eisner was, uh, you know, had, had peaked and he was having his own kind of issues and troubles and almost like club Disney was like, was the same approach as like when they opened, uh, California adventure, like California adventure was a uh, complaint that was like kind of like opened on the cheap. And like, it's almost like, you know, we were like the superstar limo of like the, <laughs> the, the, the kid, you know, the discovery, you know, zone, you know, Chuck E. Cheese, you know, thing where, you know, you could tell there was effort made there would tell there that there was an like effort to a theming, but it just like you, like some people may dig it. A lot of people like just scratch their head going, I don't understand what, you know, what that was. And I think for club Disney, it was just that you had a lot of people who, that, that loved it. Certainly the cast members and everybody who worked there believed in the concept and we wanted it to be, you know, everything it could be. But at the end of the day, like, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, you'd have guests who come in and just be like, uh, is this it? You know, cause they were going in expecting, you know, expecting quote unquote, a mini Disneyland. It just, and it was just, it was never supposed to be that, but they also guests didn't know any better to not have an expectation to think it wasn't going to be a mini Disneyland. So, um, you know, it was, definitely heartbreaking for all of us when it closed because we all you know put our heart and souls in it. we loved the concept uh and we loved what we were trying to do and each other and we and, and we made great friendships but uh none of us again like i said were surprised when it uh you know decision was made to close and uh well th- that's a uh, great to close on i do want to ask one question about club disney that i forgot to ask was the opening you were there for at the grand opening yeah uh, anything notable from any of those events other than the protesters any any notable Eisner interactions? Anything at all? Um, I he I mean he, Eisner was in there quite a few times, and also like a little bit later, uh, Bob Iger was coming in when he, when he was uh, first uh, hired and was kind of like you know shadowing uh, Eisner. And I remember like one time I was giving uh, a training in the um, the animation area where we're doing like stop motion. I just kind of looked up and I saw both Eisner and uh, Iger and a bunch of other like big ways. Like they're like watching me, you know, do it. And it took me like, it took me out of myself for a second. Like, Oh, hi everyone. You know? Um, <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, they kind of gave like a nod and they were, they were always, when they would come in, they were always like, you know, complimentary. It was never anything that was like, um, never felt negative when they were, when they were there. Um, but we, uh, we for sure, we were, we were all expecting it was going to be like, oh, you know, a bunch of, you know, craziness and it never was, which you touched on on your, on your video. Um, and again, I think the, it sounded good at the time. I was impressed by like, oh, well, maybe like scared a bunch of people away by saying how many people were going to be there. But again, like, uh, just talking to those who were in positions that would know, um, like they said, like, you know, they, they took this, the, the, the approach of not, hyping this up all that much thinking like all they had to say was Disney was building something and that was enough to get, you know, people, you know, to come out and that it, it wasn't, it wasn't enough. Um, but then there was always like a, uh, parade of like random celebrities that would come by that were like, that didn't like say they're all the time, but just like pop their head out of curiosity. Like, like Barbara Streisand, you know, came in once the, <laughs> the GM at the time, like probably fell, you know, fell over herself, you know, you know, going out to like greet her. So like, you know, so she was there, uh, at one point, like I mentioned earlier, we had this, um, overnight, uh, after hours sleepover events. And there was one child Yeah, that had to be weird, right? It was weird. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it was definitely, it was like, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, all these kids like random, like sleeping bags. And it looked like it was like the scene out of like, you know, saving private Ryan, like the beach in Normandy, just bodies strewn everywhere. <laughs> but, uh, um, there was one kid who was kind of getting homesick and, uh, waiting for their parents to show up. And the parents that picked uh, the child up was, uh, Warren Beatty and Annette Benning. Like, <laughs> so that was like, so at 3 a.m. we're like, uh hi here's your kid um like i said it was uh it was it was a cool concept but the uh it just you know never fully connected yeah and so 
Then after this, you moved on after it closed, you moved on to ESPN zone in some capacity, correct? Yeah. So I uh, was the opening retail operation or I was the opening uh, assistant arena manager for ESPN zone. So I don't know how familiar you are with the, those concepts, but the ESPN zone was basically divided into three revenue centers. There was the restaurant, which obviously being the, the main, there was a retail component and there was the sports arena, which was the more interactive gaming area where, um, combination of like different sports themed video games and then games that were, they, they were built or designed specifically for ESPN zone that was like themed to the different like shows. So like, you know, the, you know, football countdown was like a football, you know, tossing, you know, thing. We had one that was like a NHL tonight where you had like, you actually went into like a, like a quarter size, uh, uh, ice rink. I mean, the, the floor itself wasn't ice, but you'd have like a automated, like goalie that would go back and forth, have a full puck. And, uh, and, 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 and stick. And then like, start like, you know, firing goals and stuff towards the goalie. There was a rock climbing wall. So it was, you had like, there was like the three, uh, divided components of uh, an ESPN zone. Uh, so I was assistant arena manager that oversaw the gaming side of things. And then, uh, got promoted to the overseeing the hosts on the restaurant. And then I got promoted to being the arena and the retail manager. And then I got promoted on top of that to oversee all of the retail components uh, for the ESPN zone. So I would travel, travel the country, visiting different ESPN zones just for the retail side of things and working with the product development team at Walt Disney World for the actual merchandise that would go into the ESPN zones. And so uh, just what is your, you know, most, what stands out? What's the most interesting tidbit you have on ESPN zone? Do you think, Uh, you know, maybe just touch on its eventual demise or it's just kind of, I mean, it was very complacent or it was just kind of there for a while. Right. Um, and it was, I mean, it, it operated, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing on an individual basis, it was just like, well, I mean, it's making as much as it's spending, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit of profit, but not, not, nothing big enough to expand it too much. Um, so can you just touch on, touch on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, so when, I mean, when the ESPN zones first opened, like they spared no expense in, in, in both the, uh, theming of the, uh, the, the, the restaurants, the quality of food was phenomenal. When we first opened the, the whole retail and gaming areas were all great. Um, little touches they would do. It would be like, uh, you know, if you went into the bathroom, like there would be small little TV screens above like the urinals and inside like the bathroom stalls, you would never miss a moment of the game kind of like approach. Um, and again, the food was delicious. Uh, when we first opened, everything was, was, was made in house. The issue became, um, and the, the, and the, and the goal similar to like what Club Disney was supposed to do, but with ESPN zone, um, there's supposed to be one in every major like sports market in the U S like, so there was supposed to be like one in like Philadelphia, one in Dallas. Like if you, if you could close your eyes and picture and imagine, um, where were these biggest sports towns were is like where an ESPN zone was supposed to be. And we ended up putting nine of them and, you know, they were always busy. Um, they just weren't always uh, based on the overhead and the cost, everything associated was not, ex- not successful. Like, I mean, the, 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 the location in times square, uh, did phenomenal business, but rarely was profitable. You know, all things considered, like the joke was the guy selling hot dogs on the stand, like, like a stand across the street actually probably made more money, even though that we were doing tens of millions of dollars just because of the, you know, the overhead and the cost of being paying for that square footage in times square. So I think the demise of what ended up happening with ESPN zones is like, you know, you start going, looking at areas and ways to uh, cut costs, you know, so the food quality started to diminish, the gaming area started to diminish, like slowly, slowly but surely, like all these like custom games that are, that are, you know, expensive to like upkeep start coming out and just like, just, you know, just generic games start coming in um, and got to the point where the only one that still existed was the one in the downtown Disney in Anaheim because Walt Disney Parks and Resorts took that over as to for operations because at this point Disney Original Entertainment was gone. I mean, the, all three concepts failed, um, and they just closed that location uh, this past um, this past June. Uh, we all kind of like oh the opening staff for that. We all had like kind of like a, a, a unofficial. Uh, you know, going away party that we all kind of showed up for and, you know, had some, you know, had some drinks and hung out and, you know, played some games and just kind of like, you know, marked that occasion. 
of the fact that like, you know, we all got together and opened up, you know, that location and, and similar to like, you know, the kind of like the same kind of like bonds that, that I had built with, uh, uh, with people at club Disney. A lot of people had built those at ESPN zone as far as the opening staff and people, you know, part of each other's weddings, people, you know, marrying each other, like all that kind of like stuff that, that ends up like happening. And there were some people there that were there from like opening day to all the way to the day it closed. I mean, and, and that location was open for like, I don't know, 16, 17 years. Um, but it was, uh, uh, again, it was a great concept, but I, but I, the ultimate demise was, I mean, it just, it was high overhead to operate those things. They started to pivot and reduce costs in areas to make it profitable. And the quality then drops with it, you know, and that was kind of like the one, two punch of, uh, you know, putting the nail in that concept. Yeah. Well, Sean, thank you so much for, uh, joining me today and giving me so much of your uh, knowledge and time at club Disney and of course ESPN zone. Um, and again, just really thank you for your time. And this has been, this has been very informative, um, and very fun. And I'm really glad that, uh, that we had, we were able to do this interview because this is, uh, going to really solidify, um, club Disney in Disney history, because, uh, this is one of the major concepts of the nineties that I think has been very under reported. Um, so I'm really glad that we were able to have this conversation and get a lot of that information, um, confirmed and, you know, even more information added. So I really, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. Yeah, no problem. I'm uh, happy to do it. And, uh, you know, yeah, anytime, man. And uh, is there anything you want to plug um, at this point? Do you, I mean, you, you you mentioned that you have funnier tie Disney videos. Uh, I left the operation world uh, a while ago and, and started shifting into uh, uh, filmmaking and, and, and what have you. And so uh, I did a, a series of uh, uh, Disney videos like parodies for Funny or Die called uh, uh, Disney Couples Therapy. And so there was one that came out uh, a few years ago that had you know, Ariel and, 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 you know, and Eric and Belle and Beast and, uh, Cinder- or, uh, Snow White and her prince, uh, were in one wave of videos. And we just came out with the new one, uh, a few weeks ago that now has, uh, Aladdin and Jasmine and Tiana and Naveen. And I've got Hook and, and Smee as a couple. And, um, but just like, you know, fun, you know, <laughs> stupid sophomore, uh, videos, definitely not safe to watch around the kids, especially the first version. They were, uh, uh, um, a lot of bad words in the, in the first one. We cleaned up a little bit in the uh, in the in the in the in the new one, but um, not for the faint of heart. So, but yeah, you can find it on uh, YouTube or you can find it on just go to like the Funny or Die website. You can find it there too. Well, I'll put that link in the description because I, I think I saw one of those a while back and I thought it was really funny. And uh, if you're a Disney fan, an adult Disney fan, of course, um, you should uh, you should definitely check that out. And again, Sean, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, of course. Um, for everyone listening, thank you for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. And thank you for visiting Defunct Land. 